you know, I've been to 300 concerts, so I've seen a lot of shows, and there's only a handful of bands that have the energy they had. The MC5, one of the greatest bands to have come out of the 1960s. One of the most influential bands to come out of the 1960s. My name is Jason Bolanis, and this channel is called Endangered Stories, where I mostly do historical, fun little videos about a town that I grew up in. So why am I doing a video now about the MC5? See, some time ago, I did an interview with a gentleman who had seen the MC5. I wanted to hear stories about some of my favorite bands and artists from the people who saw them at their peak moments. I did a video about Nick Drake and someone who saw Nick Drake in England perform twice, which blew my mind. Well, this time, I found someone who saw the MC5 12 times. Now, I could do a story about who the MC5 was, who they influenced, who they were influenced by, the ripple effects of their story, but a lot of that exists online. I wanted to find out something different about the MC5. I wanted to find out a perspective about the MC5 from someone who was in the crowd to see them in their peak moment. That's what I find is lacking, and that's what I wanted to find out. And Rick was the guy to help me with that. So a couple years ago, actually, I had a conversation with Rick, and it was just through the telephone, so the quality isn't the best that it could be, but I tried to put together something that you could enjoy and hopefully discover something new about this group, a perspective from someone who was there at the time when the five were kicking out their jams in the Detroit area. So here's the story of Rick's journey with the MC5. Enjoy. Oh, and please, if you wanna see more of this type of stuff, please subscribe down below, click the like button, write a comment and say, you know, I love this. Please do more of this stuff. And gladly, I will fuse my two passions together, which is music and history. Actually, music, history, and history. Here's the MC5. The first time I saw them was opening for Zeppelin. And uh, I was a big Zeppelin fan. So, you know, I just bought tickets and they were there. And I thought they were great. They were second on the bill. Uh, Grand Funk Railroad opened. And then it was the MC5, and then Lee Michaels and Led Zeppelin. That was at the Olympia Ice Hockey Arena in Detroit. And that held about 15,000 people. So that was a big show. So you're from Detroit? Yeah, I was born there. Uh, I moved away for uh, a while when I was a kid. And moved back uh, the spring of 69. So I missed the initial, uh, you know, 67, 68 when they when they started and you know the grandy ballroom closed in 69 and the grandy is where they were the house band so every band that came to town and this is why so many people have seen the mc5 in the detroit area every band that came to town whether it was cream or the yardbirds or whoever the mc5 usually opened for them at the grandy so whoever you bought a ticket to go see in 67, 68, you probably saw the MC5 open for them. I mean, they had a show, a stage show, that was unlike anybody else. I mean, the energy was just nobody. The, the only Detroit band that probably came close was I, I hesitate to say, but I'd say maybe Ted Nugent, just because he was worth watching, and Iggy was worth watching. I mean, the rest of the band just stood there, but Iggy himself. But with the five, I mean, it was all five of them. You, you had trouble picking out which one of them to watch. Yeah, and they, I mean, they, they kind they, of they were all a show yeah. unto themselves, you know. Yeah. But anyway, they opened for Zeppelin, and the Detroit crowd at Olympia, you know, seemed to love them. Of course, they seemed to love Grand Funk more, <laughs> which, I mean, I wound up being a, a fan of Grand Funk, but people like me were sitting there thinking, what is this shit? You know, it, it sounded like a garage band to me, and the MC5 sounded like a like a nuclear attack. I mean, it was like, it was so much better, I thought. But out of the 15,000 people, the people for Grand Funk obviously thought they were 
there because that translated into big crowds for them down the road. Yeah, they became a big 70s act. Because I'd heard of Grand, yeah. Grand Funk, but I had never yeah, heard of the MC5. Yeah. yeah, the MC5 had a new album, and here they are opening for 15,000 people. I think I had heard them on the radio. Uh, they had a new single. Uh, the single off of Back in the USA was Tonight. And... Uh, all of us that, that liked them thought that was going to be their big break. I, I thought that was a great single. We thought, well, this is going to be it. You know, they're they're going to be huge now, and it it just didn't happen. <laughs> Very disappointing. I mean, that, I, I just I can't. I can kind of see why the MC5 never made it because. They were not everyone's cup of tea at the time. You, you had to be into a certain kind of music at the time. And uh, they were definitely unique. Well, it wasn't music for the masses. All of the Detroit bands pretty much had a hard edge to them. The MC5 weren't necessarily unique in their sound because a lot of the bands had a hard, hard rock and even political edge to them. But... The problem was none of those bands were popular. I mean, Alice Cooper was probably the first to get big fame, and that was when Love It to Death in I'm 18 made it real big, mm -hmm. which was the summer, I think it was the summer of 71. So for 68, 69, 70, and half of 71, there was a lot of great music, but none of it was breaking out outside of Michigan. And the MC5, they, they would go to other states and open for people. And typically, that's how you catch on to a nationwide audience. But for some reason, they just never caught on. And I, I'm not sure why. You know, they were very political in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And that changed around 69 or 70. They weren't as political. You know, they did away with all the flags and the... And the carrying rifles on stage and all that kind of, shit, you know, a lot of that was just theater. And it was interesting at the time because, you know, young people were sick of the war. They were sick of politicians. There was a lot of talk about revolution and everything, you know, kind of half joking, half serious. But And the MC5 were like the spokespeople for that. And they were so politically motivated at the initial time when the first album came out, that that kind of, it, it kind of overshadowed the music. People were going as much for the experience as they were for the songs. Right. And, you know, I saw them 12 times, and I'll, I'll say this, I saw them once open for Led Zeppelin. And, the other 11 times, it was always at ballrooms and bars, and there was never more than a few hundred people at the most, whereas you would go see Alice Cooper, and you know Alice played Cobo Hall, which was the big arena in Detroit. The MC5 never played Cobo Hall, except when they were open for somebody. Even though, you know, droves of people say they saw the MC5, it's mainly because they opened for big acts. People did not go see the MC5 by themselves, typically. You know, Cream would play at the Grandy and 2,000 people would show up and see the MC5 with Cream. But then if the five would play, you know, a weekend later at a, at a bar or something that could hold maybe 1,000 people, you know, you'd get a couple hundred show up. So it, it, it just wasn't translating into, into more people coming on board. I mean, Detroit was no different than Miami, Florida. I mean, people in Detroit in 1969, they liked Crosby, Sills, and Nash, and, and Rod Stewart, and Traffic, and everybody, just like everywhere else in the country. Right. The MC5 had a small niche of fans that were diehard fans, like me, because mm -hmm. I, I would go see them, you know, every couple of months, I'd, go, I'd say, hey, let's go see the MC5, you know. Wow. But you would get there, and there would only be a couple hundred people there. And they were enthusiastic, but you, you, they just weren't connecting to the masses like 
Alice Cooper did, like Bob Seger did later, like Ted Nugent did later. And, you know, they just never got out of the small circle of diehard fans that they had. And, of course, later on, you know, people like, like Slash and, and all these musicians that got famous in the, in the 70s, 80s, 90s. And Iggy, especially back Iggy. to the MC5, so people got interested. Yeah. And their fan base grew. But at the time, even in Detroit, it, you know, they weren't a big deal. They were a big deal publicity-wise. But actual shows, they just didn't pull in the people. And the same thing with the record sales, you know, other than Kick Out the Jams, you know, Back in the USA and High Time are, are great albums, in my opinion. But I don't think that many people bought them. You know, they, they probably sold more copies in Europe than they did in America. You know, when I was in college in 71 in, in Ann Arbor, which is the heart of Detroit music. And, and you could go see the MC5 on weekends and everything, but when you'd walk around campus, all you'd hear is, you know, Pink Floyd, ELP, Van Morrison, John Lennon, you know. You, you never heard, you never walked by a room and heard anybody playing the MC5. If you did, you would stop and, and talk to that person because they were like, they were like the oddball like you. I mean, it wasn't, uh, people have this vision of, of Detroit colleges, and Detroit cars going down the street, blasting the MC5. It just wasn't that way. <laughs> <laughs> they, they weren't popular enough for that. I know. But the rock and rollers and punks do a little bit of revisionist history. <laughs> we sure. over-romanticize. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's for sure. There's that famous footage of them playing at uh, at a university campus um, Carter Field, and and um, and it's true, you know, the crowd is just kind of staring at them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You talking about the Carter Field concert? That was a WABX free concert, and there was like six bands: uh, Detroit, Catfish, SRC, MC5, and uh, yeah, that was a great day. That was probably their best show, but again, it was free, and. The people in the audience, as you can see, aren't, I mean, they're, they're watching, but they're not really frantic, like, like the music on stage is. Were you at that one? I was. Yeah, that, that was a great show, great day, perfect weather, summer uh, in Detroit. It was downtown right off the freeway. It was in the football field. And, uh, there was probably, I don't know, maybe six, seven thousand people. Pretty good crowd. Wow. It was it, kind of an all day thing, you know, like a four or five hour show. And uh, yeah, that it, it was probably the best time I ever saw them. They put on a really good show that night or that day. And, uh, but again, you know, uh, I can remember standing up. Uh, you know, being excited about the playing and everybody around me just sit, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> it was just kind of weird. But we got used to it. I mean, we were always singled out as the the people that liked the MC5. I mean, it was like being an oddball. I mean, I mean, if you were there at the Grandy and, and they were headlining, you know, you were certainly surrounded by fans. But they just weren't into it like we were. I mean, we, we lived and breathed the MC5. MC5 and Stooges was pretty much all we talked about, music-wise. And other people, you know, they they would say, oh, yeah, I, I like the MC5, but, you know, they probably didn't even have a record in their collection by them. So it, it was just kind of, most fans were just kind of mild fans. We, we were more, we were into it more. I mean, I joined the White Panthers, all that shit. So I, I was into it. And what's funny about the MC5 is how many people completely missed the whole scene when they were a band and only caught on to them in the 80s or the 90s because someone mentioned in an interview that they used to listen to the MC5. So you say, who the hell's the MC5? You know what I mean? That's what happened to me. I'm 41 sure, years sure. old. So, um, Well, yeah, that doesn't surprise me a whole lot. It's amazing, man, to watch this stuff, and it's—I'm—I mean, from my perspective, it's 
you know, because I, I started listening to punk in the 90s. Um, and then I listened to MC5. And usually with the older guys, you listen to it and it's harder to get into because, you know, it's a bit more primitive to what we to what it became and stuff. But the MC5, it's up there with anything that I started listening to, you know, with the MC5, the energy and everything. It's I, I, yeah. And now I find I'm going back to the MC5 more than I'm going back to those bands I was listening to in high school, like the contemporary bands when I was in high school. Because there's also yeah. mysticism to it too, you know? There's a sense of mystery yeah. to the whole scene and the whole thing. And the story in, is even is, is great with the White Panther movement and all this stuff, you know? Because, because right after the MC5, I mean... It's not like, uh, uh, you know, Wayne Kramer did any, well, he went to jail not too long after that, I think. And, right. And then, uh, and then when he came back, he did some stuff with, um, with Johnny Thunders, I think. Yeah. But he never had, uh, that's right. That's right. So, um, I guess no one ever reached huge, I guess the biggest was, uh, maybe, um, Fred Smith who married, uh, Patty. That was probably, right. <laughs> that was probably, well, Fred's. Fred's really the only one that had a significant band after the MC5. Uh, you know, Sonic's Rendezvous band was a really good band. Mm -hmm. And and musically, I feel like they, they could have been superior to the MC5. But for some reason, at that time, that kind of music wasn't... Not many people were interested. But if you listen to their stuff... The, they were a band from about 75 to 78. And, you know, even though they were together for three years, they never even made a legitimate recording. Everything that's out from them is unofficial. Right. And uh, but, they, but they've got probably two to three albums worth of material. And it's all great stuff. I mean, good, hard-driving rock and roll. And then, you know, when... Fred hooked up with Patty, the band kind of dissolved, and he started writing with Patty, and, and she made her comeback with a dream of life and everything. But, uh, you know, Wayne and Dennis and, and Michael and Rob were all pretty much missing in action, except for Gangmore. Yeah. And, you know, Rob had a solo thing going for a little while, and Dennis and, and Michael were in Destroy All Monsters and, and a couple other bands, uh, New Order stuff like that that didn't really catch on it it wasn't you know although i'm a fan it wasn't really that great but sonic's rendezvous was legitimately great stuff they should have been signed by somebody well i feel that way about produced. the heartbreakers about johnny thunder's heartbreakers because <clears throat> i mean sure. what a fantastic album but it doesn't have the same it doesn't have that same kind of um prominence in that scene as let's say television does now you know television scene is uh -huh. like one of the one of the first quote-unquote punk bands i guess or proto-punk i don't know you'd call it but it's just it to me it's like a classic album to me i listen to it and i'm thinking okay where well, this is where the sex pistols came from it, yeah, it, it sure. sex pistols you, you sound like it. a like a johnny thunders cover band <laughs> yeah yeah well uh, you know the thing with sonic's rendezvous i, I think they lack management and they lack direction and you know they just uh, they should have been huge but you know like like a lot of bands and a lot of people they just faded into obscurity and, and broke up but that's unfortunate and now they have facebook pages maybe <laughs> yeah yeah i mean they've got a huge number of fans now but you know they never played anywhere other than a bar and uh, I, I've got a friend who's been to probably 50 of their shows. He, he followed them around all the time. And, you know, typically a band with four famous musicians in it, even, even though they were all just famous locally, uh, they had the writing and they had the good songs. So, you know, there's no reason they shouldn't have been huge. So it's hard to understand why, you know, it, it was right, right at the beginning of punk music and they, they weren't really punk, you know, they were just rock and roll, but, but still they were so talented and, and that's, that's probably just as big a disappointment that they weren't big as, as the MC5 never making it big until later. Of the three albums, is there one that you gravitate towards a bit more or play more? 
Yeah, I yeah, I tend to gravitate towards high time the most. Oh, fantastic. Uh, I, I love the songs. Uh, the 12 times that I saw them, probably eight of the times was promoting that album. I mean, th- there was a there was one night I can remember they didn't do anything off Kick Out the Jams except for Kick Out the Jams. Yeah. I mean, they were really pushing the new stuff, which I loved. After Fred died, Wayne went solo. That's one of the few songs that Wayne plays live is looking at you. One of the few MC5 songs. He, he I saw him a half dozen times in the 90s. I don't, he doesn't tour much now. But in the 90s, he would always do Kick Out the Jams. He'd always do Ramblin' Rose. He'd always do Looking at You and usually Poison. Those would be the only MC5 songs he would do. Everything else was his solo stuff. Right. Uh, from his albums that came out in the 90s. But, uh, so he had adopted that and he played the solo just like Fred did. But on the, um, back in the USA, that's all Fred. Or mostly Fred. Mm-hmm. Fred wrote it. And, and I don't know if you've ever heard, have you ever heard the original single of Looking at You? With, a. Uh, it's it's very raw, very uh, it's a lot of feedback and distortion. It, it's a lot different from I, the I'm, back in the USA version. Yeah, I'm not sure. I may have. I'm just the one that's yeah. on the back in the USA. That version is so prominent in my mind, and I'm not yeah. sure about the other one. Well, the other one is a lot different, a lot rawer, and. Uh, that one, from what I understand, was Wayne wasn't even there when they recorded it. It was oh, wow. kind of like a demo, and they they wound up releasing it as a single on a obscure label when they were between labels. You know, Electra fired them after Kick Out the Jams, and they got picked up on Atlantic. And before they went to Atlantic, they put out the Looking at You single on a on a real obscure. Uh, I think it's A squared records. And uh, anyway, it sounds a lot different. So you still listen to it today as you did back then? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I you know I have so many records. I, I've got six thousand albums, so I, I'm a music collector, really. Uh, so I I don't really listen to my favorites. I, I tend to try to listen to everything, but. You know, once in a while, I'll, I'll pull out High Time or kick, kick out the jams, just play the whole album, just for the hell of it. <laughs> so, yeah, I still li- I still listen to it. I'd say fairly regularly. Right. Yearly, I'll put it that way. And, and Which, that, to me, for me, that's regularly. Would you confidently say that uh, everyone's always trying to find the, uh, the beginnings of punk and who started punk? Would you attribute that oh, to wow. the MC5? Well, you know, I, I, they had a punk attitude. They had a, they had a blitzkrieg sound, which is associated with punk. But when punk started, you know, with, with people like the Ramones and the Pistols and the Clash and all that, I never really thought to myself, well, the MC5 started this. You know, I've been to 300 concerts, so I've seen a lot of shows and there's only a handful of bands that had the energy they had and all the punk bands that I liked and that I saw, I never really connected. I I connected a lot of the punk stuff more with Iggy than I did with the MC five. And I don't know why. I I don't know if it was because of the mute. I thought the music was more melodic or structured with the MC five or I, I don't know why I didn't, connected it as much Mm -hmm. but I didn't so I really think punk was more of a it was more of a the young people at the time were doing trying to do something different it was certainly different and you know I would see flashes of, of things where I thought well you know like Steve Jones would play his guitar a certain way and I thought well that reminds me of Wayne Kramer 
Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that Steve would say the MC5 influenced him. But I didn't look at the Sex Pistols and think, well, that's a rehash of the MC5. I didn't think that. No. <laughs> <laughs> if anything, it, and, it sounded know, more it, like uh, Johnny Thunders. It, and, and, yeah, uh, you know, that, I mean, that that was a an attitude and a kind of carrying yourself and, and maybe some of the riffs you would play or the, or the way you would stand on stage, stuff like that. I would see people like the Dolls and all that. I would think, well, yeah, some of that's like the MC5. Mm-hmm. But I, I just saw it as an influence and not really the beginning. Like, I'm a big fan of Blue Cheer. And a lot of people say, well, they started heavy metal. But, you know, I'm also a big fan of Black Sabbath. And I don't see any connection between Black Sabbath and Blue Cheer. I mean, Blue Cheer was very heavy. I, I saw them twice. Very loud, very heavy, very psychedelic. I never thought of Sabbath as being psychedelic. And I I just, I guess, I guess my musical tastes are a little too refined to to connect bands like the MC5 and the Sex Pistols, even though there's similarities or the Ramones and stuff like that. I I see the similarities, but I don't really see one being the birth and the other one being an offshoot. Mm-hmm. I see it more as all these individual boxes of music and the particular bands fall into those boxes in my head. Now, there, there, you know, there are some artists or bands I see, and I see a direct correlation. But I don't, I don't, I never thought as the, of the MC5 as the fathers of punk music or anything like that. It sounds like the MC5 are sort of on a deserted island all on their own. They 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 came, they existed, yeah. they left, <laughs> and that's it. Yeah, I'd, I'd, prefer, I'd prefer to think of them as that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. All right, then. Uh, yeah, you message me, and we'll uh, we'll stay in touch. Cheers, man. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.